Need motivation? Watch the top 10 of Believe Nation because I love it. There is no discipline without a schedule. It's so easy. If your calendar doesn't have anything in it the next six weeks, don't be mad at yourself for lacking discipline. No one shows up on day go, it's discipline day and has nothing to do. Discipline requires the schedule. So fill out your schedule, work the schedule. Fill out the schedule, work the schedule. Fill out the schedule, work. As you fill out your schedule and you work the schedule, you get more self-trust. With that self-trust comes confidence. From that confidence comes more competence. We gain more mastery and we're in the game more. We feel good about ourselves. The progress mind loves it, eats it up. It's like, hey, we're doing it. We said we were going to do it. We did it. We moved towards our outcome today with a schedule. What an idea. Rule number two, explore the world's menu. Put yourself in new novel situations to discern what you like. I'm sure many of you guys you get the questions too from you know younger kids and their you know teens or in their twenties who who ask you, you know, but I don't know what my passions are. And what do you always say? Go do stuff. Like, you, like passions and interests emerge out of actions, not contemplations. So you don't just sit around and contemplate what am I passionate about and come up with something. You need to experience the menu of the world a little bit and go, oh, I like this. Just like, I never knew I liked sushi. I never sat in a room one day in Montana and go, I like sushi. No, I had to go experience culinary from all over the place. And I went to a sushi place. I'm like, I, I'm a guy that likes sushi. And now if you hang out with me, I'm like, let's go. I'm, I'm passionate about sushi. I never thought in a room I'd be passionate about sushi one day. I had it and became passionate about it. You find your passions by living an active life. When you don't have passions, we just gotta get more menu in front of you. This is why you always growing your network and your relationships to discern. Like a lot of people hope their purpose just lands on them. Like your purpose is found out in the world. Your purpose is found by living and choosing how you want to live and living a purposeful life and more purpose shows up. If you want deep relationships with people, you're gonna to have to uncover your passions. You're gonna to have to express those passions and you're gonna to have to elicit their passions. Rule number three, embody your message. And the third thing that great leaders are always doing is embodying their message. They stand for something. There's a congruence between who they are, the behaviors that they're enacting into the world, how they treat people, what they're working towards, and what they say is important, right? That, that's it's just basic line, it, it's integrity. You know, it's a congruence to believe between what we say we're after and how we are behaving. And there's nothing more important, is there? You know, it, it's like, it's that old message, it's like you don't believe the message unless you believe the messenger. So as leaders, we have to stand for and demonstrate and show and portray what we are really believing in. I mean, are we really, are there, is our team and the people around us seeing us work for it, sweat for it, sacrifice for it, champion it over and over and over again, even when it's hard, even when there's conflict, even when people are pissed, even when people want to quit, are you still there? Do you still stand for it? If you do, you become a legend. Rule number four, Repair within 48 hours. You got 48 hours tops to repair, which I believe is super generous. I used to teach, I used to teach, you get four hours to repair. And I was very well educated by some marital therapists being like, well, that's not everyone's style. Some people don't go sit away. But if you sit on it for more than 48 hours, you have to understand their memory and your memory has now coalesced against something being true. And the longer you wait to repair, the more what you believe to be true is solidified and calcified. And it's harder to change a perspective or to let go of that, right? It's calcified, it's hard now, it's harder. It's more fluid in real time and in the moments and hours afterwards to being defined and released. The longer you hold it on, because you, some of you know this, some people are holding on to stuff that happened to them 20 years ago. 
I, I remember going back to a high school reunion. I was talking to a friend and I think it was our 25th and 20, 25th, 20th, 20, was talking about something that happened in high school. And the way they were talking, I could not believe they were still so upset about it. Now I, in my mind, thank God, I thought, okay, well, that was traumatic for this person. Um, I have to understand that. But if there's still bitterness, hatred, anger, but also most importantly, judgment against others, now we're trapped in the ego and we need some help because that's the difference maker. Like we can have something that was traumatic, but if it's still in that place where there's vitriol and judgment against others, that becomes very toxic in our own mindset. And we got to deal with that stuff. Again, sometimes that takes therapy to learn to repair those things. But in motion with your relationships, I'd love to set that 48 hour rule for you. I personally am a believer. I came up in a different culture. I came up in the never go to bed angry thing. Go to bed, like repair, resolve, coordinate, love, like let it go and go to bed. I know that's not true for everybody. So maybe you gotta eke it out in that next day. But I would say if by the end of 48 hours, you haven't brought up that you're upset. That is a weakness in your communication style, not something to continue holding against them. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number five don't fear judgment how often does your passion show up in a group setting every week how often does your passion show up in a group setting every week well if, if it's not that explains why the bonds of the groups that you're around aren't that deep yet. You have to both inject your passion into conversations so people actually know what you think about, what you're interested in, what you're deeply thoughtful about. Like all of your friends, and I want you to write this down, all of my friends should know my passions. All of them. Otherwise, they're strangers. All your friends. I'm a person like, if you know me, you're gonna know my passions real fast. I, and people say, yeah, but I can't tell my family this, they think that, or I can't tell her that, they think that. I'm like, what are we in high school? Are you really holding back your passions based on what someone else will think? That's okay in high school. Once you hit 18, that's no longer allowed. Now that's just called sabotaging yourself for no reason whatsoever other than your internal fears of embarrassment, which by the way, shouldn't last that long after 18 years old. Not when you're doing the personal development work. Like get over that, it's okay, everyone should know. And if they have judgment to it, guess what? They also judged your clothes today. They also judged your hair today. They judged your website. Who cares? Why is everyone so scared about judgment? The less you are worried about judgment, the greater friends you have. When you realize if, cause you know what? I want people, I want people to reject me. Because if I'm not in their tribe or I'm not their guy, great. I don't go spend a bunch of time trying to build relationship with somebody who's like that. So don't fear the judgment and don't keep pressing down, suppressing or quieting your passions to try to fit in to try to be liked, share what you love, share your passions. Rule number six, enlist other people. As you're developing this vision, it's not just your vision, you're enlisting other people to share their voices, their perspectives, their dreams, their desires for where you could be going. You know, I think that the most important leadership lesson in the world is that people support what they create. If people are involved in the ideation of a vision, 
They're involved in creating ideas, of brainstorming, of figuring out what is it we are about? What do we stand for? Where are we going? Great leaders enlist that from other people. They're, they're constantly asking people what they think, how they feel, what, think, what think, things they desire and need. And it's that enlistment that is always going on. A great leader is always enlisting other people to, to, to believe in the dream, to shape the dream, to stay dedicated to the dream. It's an honest and uh, an authentic and a genuine desire to see other people be involved in the process and to enjoy that process. I mean, it, it's so vital. And that methodology of uh, what, you know, how do you get people involved in that? You're asking questions. You're paying attention to their needs. You're reflecting back to things that you're hearing. You're always enlisting others to support and to build this vision, this ideal future together. Rule number seven, practice explicit communication. We must be more explicit when we're upset with people and let them know. I would say nine out of 10 things that I do to upset Denise, I have no clue. And I don't think is a big deal at all. But the one out of 10 she tells me, I'm like, I'm an idiot, I'm sorry. You like explicit communication is the most important thing in all of repair, all of it. You must say it, you must not hint at it, you must not be passive aggressive, you must use the words to describe exactly how you felt and what your request is for next time. Describe how you felt, not describe what they did, describe how you felt, and then make the repair request for next time. Next time that happens, can we do this? You must know your outcome. How can you possibly be focused or disciplined if you don't know the outcome you're after? Most people don't lack focus or discipline. They lack clarity that would give them the focus and the discipline. That's why the first high performance habits is seek clarity. We learned it from our research, right? Well, an outcome, what am I after here? What's the goal? What's the tangible or intangible thing that I know when I get there, when I see that, feel that, experience that, achieve that, that's what I'm after here. That some kind of outcome. You won't stay disciplined unless you can see, feel, sense, acknowledge intellectually what the outcome is we're after. If you're not disciplined on a consistent basis, it's because you don't know what you want. So don't beat yourself up that you're lazy. You just need to make a decision. You need to make a decision about what it is that you want. And it doesn't have to be what you want for your whole life, your ultimate grand purpose in the cosmos of the destiny of the universe. No, no. What do you want by Friday? What do you want by the end of the month? What do you want this quarter? It's, it's like, start there. If you're really confused about the next five years of your life, please start with the next five weeks of your life. Come on. You, People don't understand, clarity is built upon. You don't have the epiphany where everything's perfect. Very few people ever have a, a complete, perfect picture, epiphany moment of everything coming together in life. Very few people, very few people. Instead, usually what happens is, as we move throughout our lives, we get a little more clarity of what we like and what we don't like. What draws passion and strength and contribution and what doesn't. Know your outcome. You want discipline, know your outcomes. Rule number nine, support your friends. Does anyone have a friend who talks on and on and on about something that you aren't passionate about at all? Anyone out there? Encourage them. Keep listening. Don't we all need friends like that? It's important. It's important for you to listen to other people's passions and it's okay if there isn't. I have one friend that is so passionate, I mean, insane, like, otherworldly passion about video games. Now, I haven't played a video game in, I don't know, I don't even know how to use the controllers. Anyone else have that? You ever go to your friend's house and their kids pop out the video game, they hand it to you and you get this controller and it's like a spaceship and you don't even know what it does? That's me. I don't know, I don't know how to play a video game. I'm not interested in video games at all. Like it's not even, I'm not even interested in it. And I have this friend, we will go out and he will tell me about video games for like 90 minutes. And I'm so interested because that's his passion. When someone's talking passion, you know what you say? Tell me more. It doesn't have to be your passion. Stop listening for what you want to be and experience and who you are and honor and see the other. 
their passions, their ideas, their goals, their concerns. That's how to win friends and influence people. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is make someone's day. Adopt a little bit of a mischievous mindset. Here's what I encourage you to do. Every morning when I'm in the shower, I think, what could I do today that's a little mischievous and fun for somebody? Not fun for me, fun for somebody. What, what can I do to, 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 to cajole, to tease, to, to prank somebody who I love, not in a mean or disheartening way, and, but in a real fun way? What, what can I do to, to make some fun between us, to make some jokes and stories between us? What unique things could I do to make somebody's day? Even if, just think of this, what could I do today to make somebody's day? And you know what? You'll find that fun and fulfilling. And when you start having days that are much more fun and fulfilling, and you have weeks that are more surrounded by friendship, doing things that you care about, that you find fun, and you're fully immersing yourself in those experiences, well, over a period of time, all that fun and that fulfillment, that gives you the charge life. Empowerment means we give people the decision-making authority and the trust to be able to work towards this vision, to allow them the autonomy, the strength, the input, to, to equip them with the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the technologies, the tools, the training, to allow them to succeed as they march with us to achieving something extraordinary and phenomenal. That's vital. That's what empowerment is about. And a lot of leaders who come in with a big vision, they get everyone excited, you know, they, they, they seem like they, they want everybody involved and they do a great job of standing for it, but they don't equip their teams to kick some butt. They never get to that place of real stride, of, of, of real momentum. And that happens all the time. Training other people and equipping them with everything they need to succeed has to be a vital practice of every great leader. And again, it doesn't happen just once. That's a huge failure in the working world, especially in corporate America. Great leaders come in, they nail the vision, they get people around it, they stand for something, but they only empower people at the beginning. They give some training and then they just disappear. Training has to be consistent, coaching has to be consistent, equipping people to deal with the new challenges, the new tools, the new technologies, the new competitive realities. That's vital, we have to have that in Place. Research study in psychology found out that both second person and third person makes you more, uh, makes yourself talk more powerful. So if you're gonna do affirmations, you wouldn't just say, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. You wanna do what we call in the book self coaching, where you would say, you know, in my case, yeah. Brendan, it's important you do a good job here today because you usually don't do interviews and you really love Marie and you wanna do a good job for her and her people. And this is a book you worked on for three years and it's important it does well. And Brendan, don't forget, you're so lucky you get to do this, brother. So just enjoy the process. You're so lucky, Brendan. That's a different level of going, I'm lucky, I'm lucky, right? <laughs> it is. I'm Brendan, I'm yes, great. Yes, <laughs> yes. Another one, another one I do every morning in the shower. Yeah. Assuming I take a shower, but every morning in the shower. Because we all don't every day. Let's not every morning. Not. No, we do not. It just doesn't happen. It does not it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. <laughs> I told you, like, 24 hours ago, I was staying in a barn in the woods at a friend's house. Yes. Um, <laughs> but the second thing I ask myself in the, in the shower every morning is what might happen today that could trip me up? Mm. And how are you going to bring your best self to that, Brendan? Mm -hmm. I say that every morning in the shower to myself. And it just helps me anticipate, that, you know, something's going to go wrong during the day. Absolutely. And if I already know everything, like, like this morning's was, okay, you're in... Think what we would. I think I'm yes, North Manhattan, where I'm staying. Would you call it North? I'm you're Manhattan. uptown. I'm uptown, and you're coming to. Um, let's just call it downtown. Okay, yes. so I'm like, okay, that's going to be 45 minutes. It's a hot summer day. Yes, uh, I, I'm going to get hot, and I know when I'm hot. Sometimes I get impatient. Yes, and I get stressed, and I don't want to feel that. So just pay attention to how you're feeling on your way down to the interview with Marie Brendan, and really just engage. Pay attention, be present with New York, and really enjoy that you're here. I know that sounds completely crazy, but every high-performing athlete does it. Every salesperson does it. I mean, at high level. Every person I interviewed who are at what we call the top 15% of all high performers. Outside of teaching people to bring the joy in my life, I teach people to honor the struggle. Honor the difficulty. When we honor the struggle instead of hate the struggle, 
we can really achieve extraordinary things because our mindset's in the right place. It accept, like, as soon as you honor the struggle, you accept that, oh, of course, there should be struggle here. I should, I should honor this process. When you go to the gym to work out, you like honor that this is gonna be hard and it, honor that process of getting better. And the more that you bring honor to it, the more your psyche builds with strength and you get a little bit of that esteem back because you see yourself engaging something versus avoiding it and running away. You see yourself connecting with something and giving it reverence. You're like, like I have reverence for the difficulties of life. They may be better. So I, I don't want a friction-free life. I'm not interested in it. You know, the, 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 I, I like to say sometimes that you know, the journey to greatness begins the moment that our you know, deep desires for comfort and ease are overpowered by our desires to connect and contribute. What is that habit that you take on on a daily or monthly basis with habit, uh, with clarity? What do you think about? You're like, every morning, what am I clear about? Or, yeah. you know, how um, do you apply that habit to your life? Uh, I apply it in a couple of ways. First, for me, uh, every situation I go into, I'm consistently asking, like, what, what's the feeling I want to have here? If you ever see me teach, it's often, I always say, bring the joy. So I have joy triggers that I've set up in my mind that makes me more intentional mm. about things. So for example, I have a door frame trigger. Whenever I walk through a door, I say, bring the joy. So when I walk through that door right there, mm. it's like, bring the joy into this room. It's just a, it's just a mental trigger that I've set up mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. Every morning in the shower, I ask myself three questions. And not that I shower every morning, but <laughs> <laughs> the ones I do, I, the first question I say, what can I be excited about today? So it forces me to be clear about what's going to draw joy, enthusiasm from me. Mm -hmm. Number two, I say, what might trip me up today? Because usually I know what's going on in the day. I'm like, what, what might mess me up? What might, where am I not perform well? What might bother me? And number three, I say, what can I do to surprise somebody today? Hmm. To give a gift of appreciation or acknowledgement today. And so I think through that in the morning. So I think that helps me begin my day pretty clear. Um, then when I sit down before I do work, I literally look at my calendar of the day, this is morning, and I look at whatever's going on the day, and I think about it for 20 minutes. It's one of my 20 minute routines in the morning. I literally think about my calendar mm. for 20 minutes a day. And people think that's crazy, but what I'm thinking through when I'm looking at the calendar, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have that call. What do I want to happen on that call? You know, what's my intention for that call? What's my goal for that call? What's the feeling for that call? How do I want to end that call? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna have that time with Lewis. Like, how do I want to be there? And, and, and how can I make sure I enjoy it? Because it's a big deal, mm. you know? I love your show. I, I wanna do a good job. I, I wanna share something good for the people, even though I have no idea what you're gonna ask. In, right, right. In this. I, just, I, I, want, I want to be present for that and, and make sure I, I, I'm, I'm really there, even though maybe I have a head cold today. You know, it's like, that, that, it's like just thinking through it. I think that helps me. It keeps me asking questions every Sunday. I do a life arenas assessment. That just means I think there's 10 areas of our life and I score myself in them. Mm -hmm. And this is about my 11th year of doing this. Wow. So each area of my life, you know, from, from emotional quality to happiness, to relationships, to time, to hobby, et cetera. I just give myself a score of one to 10. And one means I suck. <laughs> and I, I was horrible in the previous week on that. 10 means I did a good job. And then I ask, how can I do better? Mm -hmm. It's my Sunday routine. Yeah. And it just keeps me clear. And it's not like I don't sometimes, like everyone else, you know, wonder what's going on or what I'm doing. But those habits, those were my habits. You have to establish your own for seeking clarity. Right. But when you have them, you weaponize your life. Transitions take place in, in the chapter of Generate Energy. And also, maybe it's in Productivity too. Uh, and it has this converse, it's just a conversation that if you're go, 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 go all the time, mm -hmm. you're depleting energy all day and you don't know it. And lots of people think to get more energy or be more productive, they have to radically change their life. I'd better work out an extra 60 minutes in the morning. It's like, actually, let me teach you the mastery of managing transitions. When you go from one activity to another, I wanna teach you this simple thing. And that is release tension, set intention. Very simple. Let me give you the example because it really helps. If you're doing email, and you know that, that takes one part of your, your, your psyche and brain to do a lot of email, and now you're gonna go create that keynote or that PowerPoint presentation that you want to be flowing and visual and beautiful, very different things. What most people do is they'll do their email 
and then they'll work a little on the presentation, then the notification will come over here, and then they'll go back to the email, and, da -da 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 -da, and they're multitasking. Yes. And they're wrecking not only their measurable creativity, but their long-term performance. And so what you have to do is, when you finish the email, stop it, okay? Maybe go get some water, come back, or whatever, you, even if you don't. All I want you to do, push away from your chair for a minute, close your eyes, repeat the word release with the goal of releasing tension in your body, and repeat the word release yourself several times, over and over, like a mantra, mm -hmm. okay? Just repeat, it could be 60 seconds, it could be one minute, it could be two minutes, whatever you wanna do. Just do it until you feel like your body and your mind release a little bit. Then, before you open your eyes, set an intention. Say, okay, Brendan, you're gonna work on this keynote now. Your intention is to make something that grabs them right at the beginning, and then, Make it really move fast and make it, um, make, make it visual and make sure that it builds emotionally throughout the thing. So when you make the call to action at the end, bam. And then open my eyes, now work on the presentation. I'm clean and free mm -hmm. from the previous activity. Yes. And people will feel an unbelievable amount of energetic, just power come back from there. I interviewed or I worked with uh, a, a major founder in the startup. Silicon Valley world, flew me down at 3 a.m. and uh, I guess it was really after midnight on a private jet. It was just this crazy, he was having a lot of trouble. Just exhausted, literally depleted. Um, you know, this person's incredibly well valued in his company, lots of employees, everyone knows who the person would be, but miserable. Just go, 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 go. And I said, well, what's going And one of his major things was he was wrecking his relationship with his wife and his children. Because, not because he was, maybe just overworking, he would just carry a lot of the work into his house. Yep. So one of these guys, I want you to pull up to your house after the day of working. Don't get out of the car. Pull up the, pull up the house, just close your eyes, repeat the mantra, release yourself, maybe for five minutes. And then before you open your eyes, set the intention. How do you want to be with your wife when you enter the house? What kind of dad do you want to be to your daughter? Just set that intention. Open up your eyes, now go in as a different man and it changed his life. His email to me is in the book. I read it, it's fantastic. It just works. That means just release tension, Yep. set intention. It's just, your transitions are where most people's bleeding out their energy and they don't know. And if we can just get you four or five times of transition really well throughout the day, you finish your day like, I feel amazing. Yes. And we didn't, we didn't caffeinate you, we didn't do anything. We just changed how you approach your work. Get up in the morning, I drink 20 ounces of water, I do 20 minutes of mobility, movement, and stretching every morning. Then I read for 20 minutes something positive. For me, it's almost always a self-help book or a leadership book, almost always. Sometimes a business book, almost always self-help and leadership. Read that book. Then I go and I sit down with my high performance planner, my green tea. I fill out the day, right? I look at the blocks of time that are already scheduled. And then what I do is my second visualization, which is I look at the major blocks of time that have been scheduled, just like this, this morning, and I close my eyes and I think, how do I do that thing with excellence? What would make that thing special? So this morning, before I got here, when I thought about this, because there's my high performance planner, impact theory, Tom Bilyeu, oh yes, three exclamation points, literally. So I, I looked at the schedule, I closed my eyes and I thought, okay, what do I want to communicate on Tom's show? How do I want that to feel? What do I want to communicate? So I literally close my eyes and I visualize those blocks of time. And how would I do them well? That's a superpower. Most people write their day out and then they just go about the day and then they, sometimes they come back to the plan and they go, oh my God, I didn't even do it. Because I sit there and I think about how do I do that well? That's the game changer. What does that rebuilding process look like for somebody who's trapped in depression and suicidal thoughts? Yeah, um, I've been there a lot in my life, uh, especially before my car accident, my teenage years. Uh, then the first woman I ever loved, we had a big breakup and that breakup sent me down in depression and suicidal planning. And uh, it's tough to dispense advice to people other than get help. And I'll share why. Because that time in my life, I had so many people coming up to me. You know, my friends would come into my dorm room, like, Brennan, let's go do something. And you just, there's just, the, the hope is lost. And what people, I think, make the mistake of trying to do is hype people up. Everything's gonna be okay, you're gonna be great. 
And what people need who are suicidal is serious psychological intervention. They need to seek support and help. And outside of that, when they do get that support, the first thing a great therapist is going to do, outside of the emotional reflection work of why are you here and what has caused this sort of pattern for you, they're going to get you starting to get some momentum. The, the most important thing is when you are super down, outside of finding that emotional reasoning for where you are, is to start getting momentum. Because with momentum comes hope, with momentum comes motivation, with momentum comes uh, uh, you know, that feeling that there's a reason for tomorrow. And so it's as simple as just saying, okay, what are three things I'm gonna do today? And I don't mean that like a lot of personal development guys would say like, what are your three big goals for the day? Arr! I'm like, dude, sometimes that first goal is, sh I'm gonna shower today. I'm really gonna shower today. Uh, I'm gonna walk to the library. I'm gonna come home. And that's all they got. Like literally, that's all they got. And you gotta honor that struggle when you're in that place, like know that where you're at, it is okay that you're there, and now you're gonna need help, and now you're gonna have to set up some daily practices just every day, win a little bit. Not like win your dreams, not like crush through goals, not like be a badass, not like, no. Just momentum, man. Next habit is high performers develop influence more than those around them. It's not because they're cool, so, I mean, look at me. <laughs> what, I'm not getting ahead on my cool factor here, ladies and gentlemen. I just got these, these new Nikes. I Those walk in the cool. store. I, I walk in the store. I was like, <laughs> what's your newest shoe? They're like these ones. I'm like, I need that. And they're like, why? I'm like, because Lewis has sneaks, man. I, got, <laughs> I, I, I wear suits or like I'm either on stage in a suit or, or at my you know studio. Kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of formal too. Sure, sure. Um, I was like, man, I got to get some sneaks. Oh, they look good, give me, man. I said, give me your newest sneak. So I'm not getting ahead on the cool. I don't develop influence because I'm cool. It's not your personality that gives you influence. Yeah. It's how you treat other people. Mm -hmm. And specifically the way that people, high performers gain influence is, is this way too much? No, I'm, I'm loving I'm, it. I'm, I'm, yeah, you know, get it. How you treat develop, other people. Here, here's, how you do, here's how you develop influence. If you really want high level of influence, obviously you got to do all the basics, treat people nice, be kind. And in the book, what I do is with each habit, I say, here's the basics. But then I go, here's what the needle mover practices are. The highest performing influencers, what they're doing, often they don't know they're doing it, by the way. The first thing they're doing is they're teaching people how to think. A lot of your show gained influence, I really believe, because you're really good at teaching people how to think. Mm, thank you. You're shaping their mindset. But high performers are really doing it uh, explicitly, and you do this too, where you say, here's how to think about that, guys. Or high-performing leaders tell their team, here's how we should be thinking about ourselves. Here's how we should be thinking about the competition. Here's how we think about the future of the company. They're saying it. They're explicit. More often, here's how to think. I mean, the, 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 what is it? The seventh most read book in the history of the world is Think and Grow Rich. Crazy. It became that way because he taught people how to think about money. We have to tell our audience how to think about things. Mm. The second thing they're doing is they're challenging people. And they're challenging in a specific way. If you listen to a great orator, he's a great speaker. The pros, the one I know, I'm like, oh, this person studied speech before, is they challenge the audience in three ways. They challenge the audience's character. Then they challenge the audience's connections, their relationships. Then they challenge the audience's contributions, what they're giving. Mm. You hit all three of those, the audience is like, I have to listen to her. I have to listen to him. Because not only are they shaping how I should be thinking, because maybe I was thinking wrong, but now they're pushing me because, you know, it's just like a great coach. The greatest coaches, they're not just saying, throw the ball better. They're like, Lewis, you're a better man than that. Come on, man. Mm. They're saying, look, you're treating your team like crap. They're like, look, look, you're not contributing to the team here. That's a different challenge than just throw the ball faster yeah. or catch the thing, you know. So I studied that from them, but those are the primary things. And the third thing, of course, is role modeling, you know standing, I mean, if, I, if I'm the bring the joy guy or I'm the honor the struggle guy or I'm the high performance guy and I'm off my game, mm -hmm. phew, people are going to know that. Yeah. Know? So that's, I'm always trying to role model what I do, which is hard <laughs> when you're talking about high performance because yeah. everyone thinks, well, don't you have a bad day? I'm like, dude, I, I have bad moments. I wouldn't say bad days because yeah. I don't want to go to bed and feel like the day was bad. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think that's why they're developing influence. High performers are not dissatisfied strivers. 
They're not. They're happy. High performers are happier than their peers. We all believe that to get the top, it's going to be lonely at the top, and we all believe you have to grind and kill yourself to get there. Yeah. And that's completely wrong, and yes. the data proves it worldwide, which is, I think, just overcoming a lot of people's biases about how you work today, because right now, especially today, like, you know, grind on social media is so popular. Or hustle. Like, or hustle. And it, it, by the way, none of the top 15% of high performers worldwide identify with those words. They literally don't. We asked them, we did a whole keyword analysis. Yep. This was actually pretty cool. And high performers explicitly say, these, these are the three driving feelings. If we said there was a high performance state, mm -hmm. it's, it's driven from these three things. Number one, full engagement. Yes. Number two, joy. Yes. And number three, confidence. Yes. That's what they relate with, okay? That's where it's coming from. It's a joyous journey, not a dissatisfied one. And this, I had this conversation in the book um, because uh, I kind of maybe frame it this way. Each of these chapters opens with a vignette of somebody I worked with or a situation that I was in that demonstrated high performance. In this particular situation, I'm walking on a stage, thousands of people, after a very famous musician was out there and was telling the audience that that person's secret to success, remember thousands of people, yes. their secret to that person, their whole speech, their secret to success was never settle. Never settle, nothing is enough, never settle. And never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. Always demand more. And I'm like, oh, my second slide, which was going to be on jumbotrons in like 80 point text, was strive satisfied. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to dispel this for all these thousands of people. I was totally freaked out. Yeah. And but what I had to explain to people was not only the data, but it's this: uh, if you're never satisfied, I mean, what, what, is, is it true that life is precious? If it's true that life is precious and you could be gone tomorrow, do you really want to think, you know what, I just never felt fulfilled. I never allowed myself to have a moment of credit. I never allowed myself to have a moment of peace. I never allowed myself to look at that and say, good job. That's not the way to live life. Right. I think just at a spiritual level, it's a bad move. And this book doesn't really go into a lot of that. It's more about the science and the heart stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important that people realize your job is to strive satisfied. And if you strive satisfied more often, mm -hmm. you will be more of a high performer. And if you never give yourself credit, you're always beating up on yourself, you're always thinking that's not perfect enough, then what's gonna happen? Dissatisfied people burn out and they quit more often than satisfied strivers. So take joy in the moment, engage with what you're doing, allow credit and satisfaction and joy to come in. You can always be improving. Of course. But be proving, be improving joyfully. Big development growth point for people is determining how do I really want to treat people when they don't agree with me or when they're hating on me or when they're discounting me or they're being mean to me or we're in a fight because I think some of those are the greatest growth areas of our life. At the end of our lives, if we have a moment of cognition, we're going to lay there in bed and we're going to ask questions about our life to evaluate whether or not we were happy with it. And what I've always suggested to people is maybe don't pretend you're living your purpose unless you know the questions you're going to ask at the end of your life. To how do you evaluate it? Because otherwise you're just kind of living randomly. But when you know, oh, I'm going to evaluate my life this way at the very end, now every day you can wake up with intention. Now every day you get to wake up with purpose, which is why I love the name of your show, because that's my thing too. It's like this, this deep connection to some type of purpose so that at the end of our life, we're happy. There's no regrets. There, there's no sadness. There's no, oh my gosh, why was I this way? Or why did I wait to do that? And I, my unique story is that I got that gift at 19 mm. years old. People should want to have a high level of joy and happiness in their life. Yeah. But they cannot, they cannot wait for it. I would say, you know, the, the power plant doesn't have energy. It generates energy. I mean, technically, it transforms energy from one medium to another. And we can do the same thing. You know, you don't have happiness. You have to generate the happiness. You don't have joy. You generate joy. And when you learn to take control of your power and your energy in that way, then life becomes so much more fulfilling and so much more fun. And it doesn't become fake or forced. 
Because you know it's fake and forced? Urgh, this all day. Yeah. That's not your natural state. Yeah. I mean, and here's how you know. Take a person, uh, you know, I just got back from big vacation with my lady and, and we were down on the beach and, and through, take any person, put them on a beach for a while and they're not like, Urgh. your natural state is like, this is beautiful, this is great. There's awe, there's inspiration, there's joy there. Tap back into that and you'll be more of a high performer. When you get the life is really short and you felt that before, either by you were threatened or you've had someone near, dear, near and dear die, but when you have that real essence in you that says life is short, have reverence for it, live it, that's a really big thing. I got that at 19 and I learned specifically that if we have a moment of cognition before the end of our life, we tend to ask questions to evaluate if we're happy. So if I have any impact in the world, it's gonna come from that experience where I learned that the ultimate lesson is determine what the questions you're going to ask at the end of your life are going to be. Find out those questions. What will you ask at the end of your life to evaluate your life so that you would know if you were happy with your life? Like figure out those questions and then live each day intentionally so you're happy with the answers at the end. For me, the answers, the questions I had were, did I live, which I hadn't, I hadn't been living my life, I'd been thinking about taking my life. Right. Did I love? No, my heart was broken. And I put up all these walls to keep out other people. And I always say, you know, sometimes the walls we put up to keep out the bad guys prevent the good guys from getting in. Mm -hmm. And suddenly in our own self-protection, we block out the very thing we want, which is connection. And I learned that I would ask, did I matter? You know, 22 years ago, on a dark Caribbean night, I'm standing on the crumpled hood of a car bleeding out. My friend we and I just wrecked a car. He's screaming at the top of his lungs. He's bleeding. We don't know if we're going to live. And I'm standing on the hood of this car, looking down at all this blood, and I'm in terror. And I just remember looking down at the hood and just thinking, did I even matter? You know? And I hated the answer at that time in my life. Because I'm a 19 year old kid. I didn't know about impact theory. <laughs> For real, I didn't know to think about that. You, some, you know, young kids sometimes, they don't know to think about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know to think about legacy, meaning. Did I matter? I didn't think I did. But the good news is I'm a good learner. And I felt like I got a second chance from God that night. And I learned that it was really important for me to figure out how do I live and how do I love and how do I matter in such a way that if I face my death again, I'll know I've earned the second chance. And so what I wanna tell people and the impact I want is I just want people to know, know your questions, man. Live intentionally and earn the life that you've been given because this moment's a blessing. So earn this moment and live intentionally. Demonstrate courage. And I think all personal development people, of course, you know, but they actually, high performers do demonstrate courage. Like we can measure it from peer feedback. We can measure it from their self-assessments. We can measure it from, uh, we have this thing called the high performance indicator assessment. You take it, you get scored on all six habits. It's free on the internet, um, on the interwebs. Um, but this one's peaked when we did the research and I didn't know it. And it is high performers are more willing to share their ideas, their thoughts, their feelings, what they need, what they want, and they do it more consistently than their peers. Even when there's risk or uncertainty, um, you do a great job. I know you have, uh, the book's coming out for you, uh, talking about men and being vulnerable. That's demonstrating courage. That's, yeah. you know, when you're not conditioned that way or you're not used to that, you know, that it might not seem like a big deal, but it, it is. Yeah. You know, um, when you talked about me doing this interview, that was like, it might not seem like demonstrating courage to go on Lewis Howes, but it is because I admire you. And I also, I'm not used to sharing a mm. lot. You know, I'm usually let the work speak for itself. Yeah. So I had to like, okay, I need to share, you know, be willing to share this in different and unique ways. Um, but I think for most people, it's when you were in your last meeting, did you share for your ideas and fight for them? Did you share for your did ideas? Did you share your ideas and mm. fight for them? Mm. When you wanted to post that video and you were scared to death because people are going to make fun of you, did you do it? And when you wanted to tell your spouse that you're not getting what you need, did you say it? Because all those are demonstrating courage. It's not just, you know, 
the courage is we think you know, pulling someone out of the river or something. Mm. And that's part of it. And we talk about the different kinds of courage in the book. Human brain has this incredible capacity for guilt. And most people unconsciously let that roll over them and kick their butt and make a horrible life. I love guilt. Guilt is a tool. Guilt is a weapon. Guilt does not have to be a bad thing. It's not like I perpetuate, but I'm like, I love that I feel bad when I don't do a good job. Most people hate that about themselves. I love that feeling. I'm like, I didn't do a good job there. Next time I will. So some people, guilt is discouragement. Other people, it's a signal for learning. To me, guilt is a signal for learning. It is the body and the brain, the spirit, knowing what is right, knowing what is wrong, knowing what's great, knowing what's mediocre. And it's saying, hey, do a little better. Now, if it's translated into a negative impulse, then some people call it guilt. But I'm like, I'm totally cool with guilt. I, you know, I think it's good that we feel bad when we do something that is below our standard or that's not right, because that impulse to go, I want to do that better. Stage one was I was honest that I was a hot mess. <laughs> you know? Like I came back from the accident and I'm like, I'm a mess. I've been depressed. I was going to kill myself. I'm sad. My grades suck. My friends are kind of like losers, uh, you know, not in a judgmental way to sure. them, but in how I wanted to feel. They made me feel bad about mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I think a loser isn't what they've accomplished. It's how they make other people feel. Mm -hmm. Two different things. Mm -hmm. They made me feel bad. And I thought, I, I don't have it together. And that began my great and long-term committed search to studying psychology. Because I'm like, why do I think so dumb? Why do I feel so bad about myself? How do you overcome, you know, depression? How do I deal with this sadness? Why do I still have so much hatred in my heart about something that happened so long ago? Like just all this, like people say forgiveness. How do you do that? Oprah had Oprah.com. And I thought, how cool would it be to have your name? Dot com. Now, I sought this kid out. So I went to Brendan.com and this guy, he had his resume up there. And that's all he had was a resume. So I emailed the guy and I'm like, hey man, I'd really love to own this website. Um, could I buy it from you? He goes, no, it's my name. I'm like, dang it. <laughs> and he says, um, no, you know, I got my mom. She's got, you know, uh, an email. We have an email associated with the domain. Right. All this stuff. I said, oh man. All right. Every, so I set it in my calendar. Every six months for six years. Whoa. <laughs> my calendar would go off and I'd email him again. Email him again. Email him again. Email him. It took six years. And my sixth year, he said, you know what? Yeah, you know, I, I'd be interested in that conversation. Sold it. So I got Brendan.com. I'm really happy about that. Really thrilled. That <laughs> stupid story. But I was like, yes. Determination. I found this quote um, that said, you know, the journey to greatness often begins the moment that challenge and contribution become more important than comfort and ease. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's really good. And so we have to challenge ourselves, but the habit here, the social habit is develop influence and you develop influence, teach people how to think, role model away, and then make sure that you are challenging people mm -hmm. in those three areas. Challenge right. their character. You got to do that delicately. The book teaches you how. Make sure you challenge relationships because that's so important and challenge people what they're giving. And if you do that strategically enough, you know, part of your message in, in, in greatness is challenging people to follow their dreams. Yeah. You say it all the time. It's yeah. one reason I love your show. You're constantly challenging people to follow their dreams. And not just like, hey, follow your dreams. Like, hey, do this. I want to learn to be confident. I want to learn how to communicate well. And I want to learn to have great relationships. So I studied those things really intensely. And I just tried them. <laughs> and I tried them and I just, I literally, I was so good about making little goal sheets and trying it. And that was the year I also began my monthly goals. So on the first day of every month to this day, I write a personal goal and a professional goal. Every day I look out on the way out, I put on the door, I'd walk out and be patient. No matter what my other goals or objectives were, that was like the defining personal theme. So I created monthly challenge themes for 23 years. You know, patients have come up a lot of times. <laughs> you know? It's like joy has come up a lot of times. Yes. You know, uh, uh, staying centered has come up a lot of times. It's not like I have ever achieved. I've no one achieves personal development. Agreed. Or purpose. Mm -hmm. Agreed. It is like an intention and a dedication 
And so that's where it started. And by studying all that, it gave me the edge. Mm. I really believe when you are a student of life, especially in psychology and philosophy, you get the edge. Yeah. Because when people are having problems, you can see perspective around it. And once you have perspective, you got superpowers. Because mm. most people are trapped in their problems. I'm extremely grateful for the patience and love of my family mm -hmm. in this particular project. It took me away more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually really grateful that I've gotten to know you better mm. and getting this to be the first like in-depth conversation with yeah, it. Yeah, it's fun. Because I think that you're very talented at holding a space for people, your team too, about holding a space for mm -hmm. people to just be like, this is me, this is what I you know yeah. about. Yeah. Um, and then I would also... You know, I'm always grateful for the God for the second chance I got from the standing on the hood of the car. Like I got it. Like knowing that each day you get up and you, it's not, you know, self-help psychobabble. It's like yeah. knowing that life is limited and you get a second chance every morning of like showing the world more of who you are, you know, breathing, mm -hmm. taking that walk with your love, just having that every day, that kind of new beginning. Um, I feel that in my career. I'm sharing that with you now. And by the time this comes yeah. out, you know, yeah. I'll have a new show out, the Brendan show. Uh, I've never done that before as a new opportunity. I'm grateful for the new opportunities. I think right now you and I have the ability to share our messages farther and wider than we've ever had before. Mm -hmm. I'm super grateful that we're alive, like right now at this time on the planet when I think our messages really need to be heard when we're, you know, surrounded sometimes yeah. by a culture, society, polit politics is so negative mm -hmm. to, 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 to have a platform to share something good right now. Oh, I'm so grateful for that. The number one issue with being productive isn't that you people usually don't know what to do with the day. It's that they look at it with dread and they accept that feeling and they stop. They go, ah, I don't wanna. So they stop even though even though if they looked past the immediate dreadful activity and looked into the future about the benefits it would give them, if they could reconnect with that, they could push through. It's that when we get in the short term, just automatic feelings, automatic emotions that come up, those things, when they're not monitored consciously, and sometimes they're not overridden, by a higher calling, a higher ambition, a higher ambition to serve, a higher mission, then what ends up happening is we go, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll skip this one and, you know, I'll get the workout in tomorrow and then workout comes tomorrow, I'll get it in next Friday and then it doesn't come in next Friday and then I'll get the work in, the work doesn't happen. And we keep telling ourselves these stories, oh, I'll do it when I feel like it. But I hope if one thing you've learned here is the power plant doesn't have energy, it you need to generate the energy in which you need to excel and serve in this world. Number one is my friend hat, which is so important. Uh, this is where when I'm having a bad day, I always say, okay, if I was coaching my absolute dearest best friend in the world who just went through the same day, what would I suggest that they do next? Not, how would I change their life? Not some big high flute and stuff. Like, what would I suggest to that person they do, like literally next, in that situation they're in? Would it be, you know what, you really need to call your mom. You know what, you, you, you need to call that person apologize. You know what, you need to send that email. You know what you need to do is take this. But what would I tell my absolute best, most adored friend to do as their very next step. Not the whole plan, just what's one thing I would tell my absolute best, dearest friend. I ask myself this question probably two, three times a week, right? Because I'll get frustrated by something, something will piss me off, or I'll be bummed that something crashed and burned. I'll be like, okay, what would I, if my best friend just went through that exact same thing, what would I say they should do first? And of course, once I think of what they should do first, then the next step comes and the next step and the next step. Meaning, kind of coach and advise yourself from a third party standpoint. I know you probably know you should do that, but here's the way that I make it stick. I write the letter. This means I sit down with a blank piece of paper and I write the letter to myself from the best friend's perspective. Dear Brendan, you're really ugly and stupid, but you're my best friend. So buddy, Here's what I recommend you do. 
about the situation that you're in. Here's how I think you should think about it. Here's what I recommend that you should do. And I literally write the letter to myself from the perspective of my best friend. Does that make sense? That's what I call putting on my friend hat and I write the letter, Dear Brendan. And sometimes it's just, I write it, it's super short. It's on a little note card. I write like 10 sentences. Other times, man, I gotta dig deep and that thing becomes like a four page letter to myself. You know, and we know from psychology is specifically dealing with therapy and trauma that if you will write yourself a letter, it does significantly change your emotional well-being. And writing it from this perspective uh, as a friend has, I have found, made my letters much more compassionate, much more thoughtful, much more positive. So I just put my friend hat on, I write myself a little letter. Dude, if you're angry all the time, you gotta change how you look at the world. Yes, there's a lot in the news that can piss you off. Yes, there's a lot going on that causes outrage all day long on Twitter or social media somewhere. But if that's your sole focus, no wonder you're upset all the time. Lots of people are angry right now because of the news or something chaotic or terrible or something they don't agree with is happening in the world. But that's not new. There's always chaos. There's always turmoil. There's always bad things happen in the world. But if that's your focus, no wonder you're having that anxiety and that frustration and that anger all the time. You gotta change both your focus and how you're reacting to things when you do see it. So first, let's work on your focus. You know, are, as much as you're angry all the time, are you also noticing the beauty of this world? I mean, the odds that you're even alive and having your breath is something to connect to every single morning. To have reverence for your life in the morning, to wake up, you know, one of my late mentors was Wayne Dyer, an amazing, amazing teacher. And he always talked about how he woke up, he rolled over, he put his feet on the ground and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you. He was grateful for his day and he began that way. And I think so many people right now, they kind of roll up in bed and they're like, and they grab their friggin' phone and they start going through the news and the social media and what are they queuing immediately? I'm queuing stress, chaos, turmoil, Clickables, you know, it's like clickbait, 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 clickbait. No wonder you're frustrated. You're activating your brain immediately right off the beginning of the day in all the turmoil of the world. Put the dang phone down, get up and think about what you're grateful for, about what you want to achieve and give and serve and create that day, about who needs you to be on your A game that day so you can focus on that instead of like this in bed. That will change how you start your day. And then listen, a lot of people who are angry all the time, they're also in outrage all the time because they're focusing on the problem all the time. And they're bemoaning the problem. They're calling out the problem, complaining about the problem, judging, criticizing, getting upset all the time. A ton of people who stay in anger all the time are failing to be solution-based. That's what they're doing, right? They're just anger, anger, problem, 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 outrage, outrage, outrage. But listen, when you become a solution-based person, when you say, okay, I actually wanna do something about this problem, and you start taking positive steps to at least address it or to participate, suddenly that anger goes into a new fire, and that fire is called enthusiasm. It is easy to switch anger into enthusiasm when you become solution-based as a mindset. When you say, okay, I don't like this, let me do something, let me, let me call somebody, let me take this action, let me write that letter, let me send that email, let me get my friends together, let's go protest, let's go get involved, let's participate, because participation turns anger often into enthusiasm. People say, Brendan, I'm scared to start my dream. I'm like, you're not scared to start your dream, you're embarrassed to be seen starting small. Big difference. It's not about the dream that's freaking you out. It's about how you're gonna feel chasing the dream. It's about how you're gonna be perceived chasing the dream. It's about how you fear at night it won't turn out the way you wanted. It's not about the dream. It's about how you're processing how it will feel chasing the dream. And once you figure that out, you see that you can rewire yourself. You can teach yourself to think differently about the journey and the process. Because look, you know, no matter how small you start, Start something that matters. Start something that brings your life back. You know, start something that makes your heart feel full. Start something that does scare you. Allow that fear, allow that worry, allow that anxiety a little bit because that's just saying you're growing, you're learning, you're changing, you're getting going. But let's be very clear. Most people, what they're really scared about is being embarrassed. 
Well, I don't know if I quit my job and I start this thing, what do my coworkers think when I do that? I don't know if I start this, what are my friends gonna say when they see me playing small and not doing big things because every big project starts with small little tasks that don't look sexy. Oh, what's, it, what's everyone gonna think about me that I chose this route when the other thing was over here and that was a better choice? What people are scared about is being rejected or more, being embarrassed. I tell people all the time, don't be embarrassed to start small. I, th I think about when I started doing videos, you know, it wasn't, you know, we're at 200 million video views now. We, I mean, tell you what, we, when I started, I was okay with the fact that it was like 10 people watched my videos, you know, nine of them was my mom on a different browsers probably hitting refresh to make me feel better about myself, you know? Like, I accepted the fact that starting small was part of the game. Instead of bemoaning that, I honored that process. I said, that is part of it. Being small in a big pond with big fish is part of the game. And only until you keep playing, keep moving, keep building, do you ever become one of the big fish. You have to be okay with being small. And so if you start your channel or you start your thing and only 100 people watch it, hey, that's 100 people who heard your message. That's 100 people who you help. That's 100 people who you change your mindset for. That's 100 people who let you do your own thing and watch. And even if they were haters, at least you started penetrating their mind. Get in the game. Never be embarrassed about starting small or scrappy or crappy because that's part of the journey. It's supposed to be that way. So don't fear it, acknowledge that's part of it. I'm gonna honor that, let's go. I was a maybe 24, 25 year old man and I was a member of Kiwanis. And if you guys didn't know, Kiwanis was, is a, it's kind of like Rotary or Lions Club. Um, it's, a, it's, a, 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 it's a nonprofit organization that's dedicated towards service in, in the community. And I was in Kiwanis and I was the youngest one, hands down, like in, in the room, we'd get together every single month on a Tuesday and we'd have lunch and we'd have a speaker in and then we'd talk about a volunteer project we were gonna do that month. And that was kind of how it went in Kiwanis for me. And so, I, but in my room, I was 24, 25, in the room every Tuesday, um, when we got together, everyone else was older. I mean, they were like, 50s and 60s and 70s older when I was 20, I was the youngest person in the room every single time. And I remember I was having a particularly challenging time because I was thinking about quitting my job, but I was scared because I didn't, I hadn't saved any money. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I just knew that I, I knew that the job wasn't the thing at the time, but I didn't know what it was. And so I was scared to make the leap and I was just, I was kind of struggling with some existential stuff because, you know, it had been four or five years I hadn't had a girlfriend. And it was just frustrating. I was like dating, but I wasn't able, I just wasn't making real connections on uh, when I was dating and I was just unhappy in that part of my life. I didn't know what I was doing with my career. I didn't have a significant relationship. I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm just kind of, I didn't feel good. And so I, I was having a really down day on that particular Tuesday. And I went in and I was sitting next to this guy and he was one of the, just one of the awesome Kiwanians that, who was there. And he was, um, I think he was probably 59, 60 years old. He was in banking, um, very successful, wealthy guy, happy, happy, just, he was like a happy-go-lucky grandpa type, you know, just a good dude. And I'm just kind of listing off to him all these things that suck, <laughs> you know? And he says, well, what are you doing about it? And I said, well, you know, I, you know, and he says, well, I bet, and he said, I bet, I know what's going on. He's, you're going home, you're probably watching too much TV, drinking too much beer and sitting alone too often, or you're going out and not having any fun and da da da, and we're just talking. My mode was, yeah, I kind of, I go inside, so I kind of pull away from people when I'm unhappy. And so I was like, yeah, I kind of pull away and I'm in my house. And he says, well, I, I know how to solve your problem. I said, oh, what is it? He goes, buy tickets. Buy tickets, what, what do you mean buy tickets? He goes, I want you to open up the paper. Remember the papers? So he says, I want you to open up the paper and he goes, I want you to see what's going on in your town and I want you to buy tickets to whatever's coming up the next seven weekends. Is, it, is there a symphony coming to town? Buy tickets. Is there a ballet? Buy tickets. Is there a, uh, an art museum? Buy tickets. Is there, he said, is there a concert? Buy tickets. And I said, what do you mean? I said, it's buy tickets. I want you to buy one, two, three, four tickets. And I want you to take your friends and I just want you to go. I want you to buy tickets and I want you to go. And I'm like, 
what the hell does this have to do with anything I'm even talking about? He goes, just buy the tickets and come back next month telling you about the tickets. And I'm like, no. And he literally pulls out his wallet. And I'll never forget, he sets down three $100 bills. And he goes, buy the tickets. Here's the money. And I'm like, what are you even? And I'm, I was literally so frustrated. It's a long story short, I'll try to keep it shorter. But so I bought tickets. I got like a symphony ticket. I uh, got a, there was like a dance troupe in town or something weird. Um, there's a Dave Matthews concert. And what else? There's one other thing. I, I can't remember what it was. Uh, shoot, there's something about the tickets. I went with one or two or three friends and went to them. And the second, I remember even, I remember the opening act for the Dave Matthews band started and I was like, got it, got it. Because sometimes when you're down and out, you got to get out and about. And so I was down and out and he got me out and about. And then with your, with your friends and you're socializing and it's in a new environment and things are happening and my mind just started turning on again. I started getting all these ideas and these dreams that I don't know where they were. They weren't in my room. They weren't in my bed. These ideas and dreams, they weren't happening in my journal. The, 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 the ideas and dreams, they weren't happening in my, my daily planner. It was like I was stuck there, so he moved me over here. Have, have you ever been like at a ballet or a symphony, an orchestra, and you're just sitting there, and all of a sudden, you feel amazing. Like the music hits you, this idea comes in, and you walk out and you feel amazing. Have you ever gone to a Broadway show? You went in and you were frustrated and freaked out because all the horrible New York traffic and all of a sudden you laugh your ass off and you leave the Broadway show and you feel like a million dollars. And now no problem is gonna slow you down. That's buy tickets. Buy tickets to the seminar, buy tickets to the event, buy tickets to the art museum, the ballet, buy tickets. And I mean, if you're down and out and your life sucks right now, go buy tickets for the next four weeks. And I promise you're gonna be like, damn, buy tickets. That changed my life. Changed my life too. And I've learned ever since then, like if I'm down and out, it's like, buy tickets. If you want more top 10 videos, they're not on this channel anymore. I have a dedicated channel just for it. Go check it out. The link is right there next to me. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.